In a recent interview, the legendary American Civil Liberties Union leader Ira Glasser, a liberal of the old school, tells of speaking at a prestigious law school and noting with satisfaction that his audience was multiracial. But then, so I'm looking at this audience, and I am feeling wonderful about it. And then, after the panel discussion, person after person got up, including some of the younger professors, to assert that their goals of social justice for blacks, for women, for minorities of all kinds, were incompatible with free speech, and that free speech was an antagonist. It happened so that the fight for social justice and against racial prejudices has become a part of the Democrat agenda in the U.S. since the 1930s. In the 19th century, initially the protagonists of progressive ideas were among Republicans. Democrats were considered to be conservative. However, the situation changed before the Second World War. After the Great Depression, the party was influenced a lot by trade unions and members of the party began to support the interests of the working movement. President Roosevelt's New Deal that helped the country to come out of the social economic collapse included a significant number of measures offered by the left. The Democratic Party is connected with the working movement until now. In particular, it has close ties with the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, AFL-CIO. Since the 1960s, the influence of the African-American wing has been increasing. Since the 1970s, the party has started to support the movement that protects the environment, which ideas became one of the main components of the ideology of the Democratic Party. By the late 1960s, the National Democratic Party had abandoned its former support for legal segregation and enjoyed strong support from black voters. President Lyndon B. Johnson, a Democrat from Texas signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 into law. Members of the party and voters who had racist views were distracted from Democrats. Since then, their main electorate is white collars with higher education, mostly urban population. Minorities also traditionally voted for Democrats, as they thought that their policy protected their interests. However, the world saw a strange picture at the elections in 2020. As all candidates from Democrats in the recent years, Joe Biden gained support of the biggest part of non-white population. In such important cities as Philadelphia, Milwaukee, Atlanta, and Phoenix, the voters of the Afro-American, Latin American, and Asian origin gave him quite a lot of voices that had a decisive impact on the results of the elections. Trump was considered to be a symbol of aggressive racism, and progressives hoped to exploit these consequences of long-term demographic changes. However, though many observers speak of Donald Trump's manifestations of blatant racism, he got more African American votes, four points more, and Latin American votes, three points more, than in 2016. The survey held by Edison Research at the request of the New York Times showed that he managed to attract one-third of the electorate of Asian origin, and this quantity was sufficient to deny the assertions of those who thought that this policy was aimed only at the interests of a small group of white nationalists. Trump's opponents, the mass media and business people supporting Democrats, are looking for hidden reasons and sometimes make absurd conclusions as a result of their discussions. In particular, they said that Russians interfered in the process of his election, and that the Kremlin influenced some of his decisions. For example, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House of Representatives from Democrats, asked the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, right in the Congress to start the investigation of financing of the president, to make sure that he is blackmailed by the Russians. Now this lady, though a very smart one, repeats, with him, all roads lead to Putin. However, is the explanation of the situation in the U.S. politics and society so simple? Illiterate Bubbas, racists with whom you cannot have a dialogue. This is the image of the electorate of their political opponents, supported by Democrats. They position themselves as the only protectors of the minorities. However, they insist on their right to determine themselves the key social political categories and concepts. For example, racism. The sense of these terms are not always shared by the other part of the society. 
democratic elites are interested in defining racism from those positions that would give them the superiority over Republicans. This partially explains the enthusiasm with which they meet semantic innovations aimed at taking into account the rights of minorities, even in those cases, when members of these groups do not see the necessity in these changes. White elites who have the leading role in formulating the concept of racism in the academic community, in the mass media and culture in general, tend to define racism using criteria that correlate with their own preferences and priorities. Meanwhile, the difference between Republicans and Democrats has become elusive to many, both of the parties serving the interests of Wall Street big business. It was no coincidence that Jeff Bezos, the Amazon head who had become the richest man on earth in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, while shortcomings in healthcare killed hundreds of thousands of Americans, supported Biden. Other famous startups of the Silicon Valley voted the same way. This is because of their close ties with the Democratic elite. Such corporations and platforms as Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, and Postmates invested $200 million in a private referendum in California that resulted in the withdrawal of the court decision protecting their employees' rights. The man in charge of setting up and carrying out the referendum was Tony West, son-in-law of the Vice President Kamala Harris, while Matt Olson, formerly Uber's Chief Trust and Security Officer, was a member of Biden's cabinet. This is not the only example of Democrats, once pro-labor, going severely antisocial. Meanwhile, Biden was trying to persuade the business during his campaign that nothing would change if he was elected president of the U.S. In the summer of 2020, he promised to those who generously supported him that his election program did not include any dramatic shift of the financial burden onto the rich. He promised to protect them in any way. Even now, Despite he is seeking opportunities to raise taxes to realize his American Families Plan, it is clear for the vast majority of people whose interests Biden is serving. The Democratic Party itself is doing its best to appear moderate and centrist rather than leftist, with all leftist tendencies inside it driven out deliberately. In 2020, Bernie Sanders, U.S. Senator from Vermont, left the presidential race despite the fact that he had a lot to offer to his voters during the pandemic. Even Donald Trump gave a hint that this was the result of an intra-party conflict. Here is how he commented on Sanders' ouster on Twitter. Sanders is out. Thank you to Elizabeth Warren. If not for her, Bernie would have won almost every state on Super Tuesday. This ended just like the Democrats and the DNC wanted, same as the crooked Hillary fiasco. The Bernie people should come to the Republican Party. Trade. Donald J. Trump, at Real Donald Trump, April 8, 2020. For the Democratic National Convention that preceded the elections in August 2020, Biden invited Republican John Kasich, an anti-abortion activist, but actually denied Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a young representative from one of New York's districts, whose popularity is growing her right to speak. As with Sanders, the reason was her criticism of the party and its leadership that Democrats could not forgive. Moreover, Democrats have often been involved in corruption scandals. One example is Hillary Clinton, who, according to an investigation by the Daily Caller based on Capitol Hill sources, tried to save Bangladesh banker Mohammed Yunus from the official investigation of a corruption affair which he was accused of. Yunus is a friend of the Clintons and donates large sums to their foundation. Hillary Clinton ordered senior American diplomats to pressure the Prime Minister of Bangladesh and her son so that the head of the government put an end to the proceedings. For example, Clinton threatened that a full tax audit of the Prime Minister's son's business would be carried out in the United States. This is what Donald Trump was trying to tell her when, in an election debate on October 9, 2016 in St. Louis, Missouri, he told her, you'll be in jail. Hillary Clinton also orchestrated an $84 million money laundering scheme in 2016, the largest campaign finance scandal in U.S. history. It was so brazen, even Federal Election Commission lawyers called for action. The Clinton machine raised excessive six-figure contributions from Democratic mega-donors before laundering it through the Hillary Victory Fund to dozens of Democratic state parties acting as straw men, over to the Democratic National Committee and into the hands of the Clinton campaign. 
Joe Biden himself admitted on camera to explicitly holding up aid to Ukraine to force the government to fire corruption investigator Viktor Shokin. After Shokin looked into Biden's son and his ties to a corrupt Ukrainian energy company, Hunter Biden, the son of the vice president, was receiving $50,000 per month to sit on the board of a foreign company, for which he lacked any relevant qualifications or experience. Hunter Biden's big money payday was essentially an insurance policy against precisely the kind of corruption investigation Burisma was worried about, and it worked for the Bidens. Accusing Trump supporters of bias, the Democrat media have long turned their objectivity rhetoric into demagogy. They do not care about the reliability of information they publish. It's virtually impossible to turn on MSNBC or CNN without being bombarded with former generals, CIA operatives, FBI agents, and NSA officials who now work for those networks as commentators and increasingly as reporters, says journalist Glenn Greenwald. Also, Michael Hayden, former CIA director, used to say that intelligence was a search for truth, an intelligence worker always trying to get as close as possible to the truth, which, to his opinion, makes intelligence and press closely related. Indeed, he started working as an anchorman for the cable news network, CNN, as did James Clapper, head of national intelligence during Obama's presidency. Another former CIA director, John Brennan, worked with the National Broadcasting Company, NBC. This was the career path chosen by many former intelligence leaders who, when on TV, used to speculate on Trump-era disinformation and the mysterious influence that Vladimir Putin allegedly had on the U.S. president. Not only do Democratic leaders hypnotize their supporters to fall in love with secret services, they also praise Republican presidents of the past, who mark the strange contrast between the past ones and the present one. Biden rewarded the Bushes for what they did for war veterans, at least for those who apparently returned alive from Iraq and Afghanistan. Michelle Obama declared that she was very fond of George W. Bush, this wonderful man, today, NBC, October 11, 2018. Some time ago, the term Trump washing even appeared, describing the glorification by the left of the most disgusting representatives of the right, if the latter ever criticized Trump or if Trump attacked them on Twitter. To create an image of the bright past, Democrats even use the memory of Ronald Reagan. The media are actively spreading fake news without bearing any responsibility. Few of the journalists who used to spread false information about the so-called Russian case were ever punished. Such an impressive violation of all principles of journalism did not prevent famous reporters from seeing themselves as superheroes, entering into a fierce battle with disinformation agents abroad and with their accomplices in the White House. In such circumstances, the idea of freedom of speech and independence of the press fades into the background. Moreover, many sincerely believe that this is being done for good. However, such a position is unconstructive and destabilizes the population, facing both the economic consequences of the current crisis and the banal fear for their own lives in corona times. Not surprisingly, society has rejected the political establishment, and political preferences are now based on totally different principles, the fact that politicians of today fail to apprehend.